for that uh, uh, introduction. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Imam Mustafa as we're, again, introducing the topic for those of you just joining us. Our question of the night is, has Islam been hijacked by radicals, Muslim radicals, that is? Um, Imam Mustafa, if you could sort of take us through the interpretation process of Islam by a Muslim who carries out acts of terrorism under the name of Islam. If you could sort of take us through what thought process the processes they're going through. Well, actually, uh, I think we go back a little bit to the title because that's going to help us. Uh, you cannot hijack Islam. Islam is the religion of one quarter of the population of the planet. There's one holy book that is the Quran for Muslims in the same original language. That is a life language. Uh, as it was revealed to Prophet Muhammad 1400 years ago by Archangel Gabriel, the most quoted man in history is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the most biographed man in history is the Prophet. So Islam itself, if you want to know anything about Islam, it cannot be more accessible at any time of history than it is right now. So for someone to deviate, for someone to commit a crime, and he has a carry, uh, uh, has a Muslim name that he carries, and whatever that he claims as a criminal has absolutely no bearing on Islam itself because the reference is right there. The real hijacking that happened is hijacking the image of Islam in the West. And that happened by radicals in the West who try to take the crimes of the few, the crimes of the people that God only knows who finance him and who makes their uh, horrible crimes that easy, like the 19 of the horrible crimes of September 11th, and make it a crime that is stamped on the forehead of every Muslim in the West and the 1.6 billion people out there, taking extremes of uh, the hit and cry uh, uh, old uh, uh, tactic or the swift boarding of people, where, as you just heard, uh, 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 Islam being the law is to be judged by the behavior of criminals or whatever radicals they call, not that the criminals themselves would be judged by Islamic law. For example, the biggest punishment and the highest punishment in Islamic law, Sharia law that they scare people with, is for terrorists. These people that committed the crimes of September 11th, had they been caught by Islam and prosecuted in a, an Islamic court of law, they would have been executed in public in a way to make an example of them. Right, but uh, so the but the crime is not the crime of Islam. The crime is the crime of criminals. Okay, but again, if you could just uh, again, t somebody that considers themselves a Muslim that carries out such acts of violence, why do we see them take out those acts of violence? Why do we see acts of terrorism being carried out only under or under the name of Islam? Why are they taking verses themselves and justifying their actions like that? I'll ask you the same question. Joe Stack, a patriotic American, uh, 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 born and raised in America, who belongs to the Tea Party, just hated the IRS for whatever reason, whatever ideology, took a plane and smashed it, killing himself in a suicide mission into the IRS building in Texas. No one considered what kind of ideology that he belongs to, if he's a Christian, what kind of faction of Christianity, and who has an effect upon them. And some people would not even call it a terrorist act. Someone in Pennsylvania the other day, a couple of months ago, took a machine gun, went into a gym, and killed 13 people for right, no so, so, crime okay. that they have committed. Okay, because we, we have to just uh, keep it. So what you're saying is there, there, we see these acts uh, of violence or terrorism being carried out, but they have nothing whatsoever to do with Islam. They are yet, the they're, most yet they're Muslims that we see. In Islam. Okay. And the big mistake that we make is that we make the criminal the ideologue. The criminal is a criminal. If you go to any jail, everyone is innocent. Okay. So you want to believe the criminals? Are they credible? If you want to judge them, let's look at Islamic law and see the punishment of indiscriminate killing of innocent people. There's no higher punishment in Islam. Okay, we will turn, I turn it back over to Dr. Pipes. Um, uh, uh, Mustafa, if you can uh, sort of answer, Islam is supposed to be religion of peace, love, coexistence with other religions. If that is true, why do we see Muslims as the primary persecutors of Christian worldwide? A lot of our audience would like to know. Well, that is not true. And I'll give you an example. Um, and actually, Thomas Walker Arnold, one of the greatest Orientalists, had made that observation, not me. He said, well, the Eastern churches were separated from Rome, so they were considered heretics of the religion. They had no support from the rest of the Christendom. Now, after 1,400 years of Islam and all these uh, uh, Muslims and, uh, uh, and Islamic states throughout the Middle East and the Muslim world, how come there are millions upon millions of Christians that live in Muslim countries who supported them through all, throughout that time and who supported their churches? 
give you that as a comparison because you say the Muslims are the main persecutors of Christians. Did the Muslims do to the local Christians what, for example, Ferdinand Isabel did to the Muslims and the Jews in Spain? Never. Convert or we kill you. Even a rabbi friend told me, even if you got baptized, you'll be killed. Did they do to them what, let's say, the Serbs did to the Bosnian Muslims? That never happened. Uh, Islam respects only two religions, that Judaism and Christianity. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and let me now bring a quote from the Prophet that Mr. Spencer claims that we need to look at the teachings of the Quran and the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Whoever would hurt a non-Muslim in a Muslim state unjustly, I am his opponent on Judgment Day. Find me a Prophet that says that. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, received the Christians of Najran and let him perform their rituals inside the mosque of the Prophet himself. Said that your rights are our rights and our obligations are my obligations. And if your churches will start to fall apart, I will remodel it from the treasury of the Muslims. Throughout history, and let me remind you again, the only non-Christian faith that believes in the immaculate birth of Jesus, peace be upon him, and Virgin Mary are the Muslims. No one else. Okay, okay but so, you... That. So, so can, can you still uh, sort of uh, wind it out? Help us understand when you say Islam respects Judaism and Christianity. What do you mean by respect? Can you can you help us understand? Because if it were a Sharia-driven society, I believe uh, Chris, uh, Christians uh, or any actually any non-Muslim would be subjugated to Islamic law. Is that true? That's one of the lies and fabrications, unfortunately, that you two gentlemen out there perpetrate without any proof whatsoever. A. Number one, Islam acknowledges only two other religions as religions, that they can build their places of worship and practice the religion freely. That's Christianity and Judaism because there are phases in Islam. Twenty-five prophets in the Quran. You cannot become a Muslim unless you believe in all of them. Sixteen of them are Jewish prophets. Jesus, peace be upon him is a major, mighty prophet of Islam. If you don't believe in him, you're not a Muslim. To start, Sharia law is the law that protected Jews and Christians. For example, uh, you look at the Inquisitions. Where did the Jews escape to when it happened? Convert or we kill you to the nearest Muslim country. For 350 years in uh, uh, England, you cannot exist if you're a Jewish person. You cannot even enter there. They were not only existing in Muslim countries in Andalusia and Spain and Portugal, they thrived and prospered with Christians and Muslims under Islamic law. Islamic law is what protected the freedom of religion of Christians and Jews. Final example, okay. Omar ibn al-Khattab, one, one of the greatest caliphs and rulers of Islam, came to pray in one of the major churches of Jerusalem. And time of prayers came in. He refused to pray inside and went to pray outside because he didn't want anyone to say, well, I seen the ruler of Islam praying there. It must be a mosque and take it over to respect the rights of Christians. Show me any place in the world that that ever happened. Okay. All right. Let, let's turn it over. I'd like to just ask uh, Imam Mustafa a few questions here. We see Saudis spending, um, Imam Mustafa, almost $3 billion trying to export their radical version of Islam globally. If that's the case, that's a lot of money. If that's the case, why, I mean, you're saying that it has nothing to do with Islam. Where are they getting this ideology from? Why are they, why are they so intent on spreading such a radical ideology globally if it has nothing to do with the religion of Islam? Well, the question itself is pregnant with a supposition that the Muslim charity to Muslim words out there is funding terrorism or radical whatever. Uh, that is not true. You do not know that. There's no objective evidence of that. Most importantly, uh, the thing that kept repeating by Mr. Spencer and Mr. Pipes, different versions of Islam, radical Islam, uh, moderate Islam, uh, terrorist Islam, Islam with gravy or whatever, there's nothing that supports that. And when we brought examples of the behavior of the Prophet of Islam himself, Mr. Spencer said that, you know what, you're bringing me back to history. You want me to bring you examples of Prophet Muhammad that are yet to come or tell you what the Prophet of Islam himself said about the topics that you're talking about? Uh, again, uh, Mr. Pipes misunderstood me. Uh, what I meant is that Mr. Pipes, being a PhD in history, when you make a claim such as that Islam is a supremacist religion or uh, is an imperialistic religion, bring me a proof from the Quran or the correct hadith of the Prophet. For example, the verse that Mr. Spencer brought that he proves the subjugation 
of non-Muslims on Muslims' land. What it means is that people who evade paying taxes should be forced to pay taxes. And that is applicable to Muslims before it's applicable to non-Muslims. Abu Bakr fought the Muslims who refused to pay the poor right and the riches money in what is known by Harbar Ridda. So you don't tell me that a non-Muslim who's living in a Muslim state afforded the peace and security in a Muslim state and he should live tax-free, otherwise he's persecuted. Mm. And these are the quality of the examples that, and we heard it so many times from Mr. Spencer, oh, it's all over Sharia, it's all over Quran, it's all over Hadith. And as usual, I authored the lies about Muhammad, 400 pages, and I answered the ideology of Mr. Spencer page by page and paragraph by paragraph, and it speaks for itself. I'll give you another example before I move real, real to quick, your before next you, question. Before you go on just to the next example, question. before you go on to the next example, let me just ask you a quick question on this example so we stay on topic. So you're saying basically um, under an Islamic state, um, it, nowhere in the Quran it states that a non-Muslim is subjugated to Islamic law, whether it be pay the jizya tax or convert to Islam or be killed. That's not listed in the Quran. Muslims pay tax, non-Muslim pay tax. For example, the Muslim tax, the jizya tax is one dinar per year, which is equivalent to $100 right, but, per but year. I'm, I'm asking you just a, a straightforward question. Basically, yes. if a, if, if a non-Muslim, I'm not a Muslim, if, if the United States became an Islamic state, would I be subjugated to either become Muslim or pay the jizya tax or be killed? If, Muslim, if you choose to be a Muslim, you pay the Muslim tax. If you are a non-Muslim, you pay the non-Muslim tax. And it's a fair tax, an example, $100 per year per person, the rabbi, the priest, the children, the women do not pay, pay what only be able to fight men. What if I don't want to pay the tax or uh, become a Muslim? What happens? What if you want to pay tax in America, which is not a Muslim state now? What would they do to you? Well, I, I, would, I wouldn't be killed. I don't, I don't think I'd be killed. Right? Well, who said that you're going to be killed okay, if you so don't then, pay tax? Right, well, well, that's part. just my question. I, I just wanted to ask the question because it's been said that the Quran does state that you have those three options as a non-Muslim in, in, in an Islamic state, which is what I want a clarification on. The verse is there. If you don't pay tax, you should be fought by the authorities like the IRS, five people in this country, if they evade or cheat on taxes, like any country in the world. It's not unique to the Muslims, and the Muslims themselves pay tax, and if they don't pay, they would be subject to the authorities for paying their taxes. On top of that, here's the subjugating uh, aspect of also being a non-Muslim. You're exempt from military service. How bad is that? I bet Mr. Spencer would want every Christian to go there and be killed, him and his children, just not to be persecuted by Muslims for not being exempt from the military service. That's the kind of uh, uh, nonsense that we hear. So I ask of Mr. Spencer and I ask for uh, Mr. Pipes, when you make these broad claims, that is in the Quran and the Hadith, show me one Hadith, show me a verse in the Quran, show me the verse before and the verse after and say that to your readers and let them decide for themselves. Okay, Robert, real quick and then we'll take our next call. You're live on ABN. Hello? Yes, you're live. What's your question and who, who's it for? Uh, hi, good evening, ma'am. Uh, my name is Rich, uh, here for short. Uh, sorry, my name is Richard Rick Short, calling from New Jersey. Uh, big text, my friend. And I had a question for the panel here. Uh, tell me, hello, Islam, welcome, Shalom. That comes to all. My question for each of you is that what real world exposure do you have to the opposite side? Uh, for the Muslim men, do you have any Christian friends that you attend celebrations or churches? To the Christian men, do you have any Muslim friends who attend their festivals? Uh, let me simplify that. Uh, I'm in the service and uh, I work with Muslim people, Muslim soldiers, and we attend each other's functions. Uh, I've been deployed with them, no problems at all. And even when I was in Iraq, I saw Christians and Arab Christians and Arab Muslims get along peacefully. So it was kind of like new term for me. Uh, thank you for your answers. Uh, God, Allah, Yahweh, bless you, and have a happy holiday. Okay, I think um, the, the, I, well, t two things. One, I'd like um, uh, Imam Mustafa t to respond, but I think that the key behind his question was uh, possibly something like, why can't uh, Muslims and Christians possibly coexist peacefully? Um, Imam Mustafa, did you want to address that? I want to make uh, clear that to validate uh, the peaceful aspect of Islam that is mandated by the Quran and the Prophet of Islam, uh, I don't have to prove that by uh, having to have uh, Christian friends and Jewish friends. I can be peaceful and I might not come along with them uh, uh, in certain ways or just not happen to have interaction with them on a business aspect or not. Having said that, 
I speak in churches oftenly. I have some of my best friends who are priests, pastors. Uh, one of some of my good friends are Jewish. Uh, I was in the financial markets before, and some of my best friends were Jewish. Uh, uh, I live in New Jersey like the gentleman, and again, all the notions that we heard before, the subjugation, the history, and so on and so forth, is not true uh, by practice. Uh, uh, Mr. Pipes mentioned that you have to pay an additional tax if Islam was applied in America. He misunderstood what I said. A non-Muslim pay a certain tax, and a Muslim pay a certain tax. The non-Muslim tax pays only one dinar, that is $100 per year. He can fight with Mr. Spencer because even Mr. Spencer admitted that in his book. Uh, the other aspect of being a Zimmi is to be exempt from uh, Islamic law. He said there's a lot of inequality between women, women and men in Islam. In inheritance, the 34 potential cases of inheritance, 30 of them, the woman inherits the same, more, or the man doesn't inherit whatsoever. Uh, the third thing is uh, that, uh, 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 you know, Mr. Pipe said that there's so many verses in the Quran, but he would still quote history. And I thank uh, Brother Abdullah for bringing the case of Musa bin Maimun, who is not only uh, considered one of the leading Islamic philosophers, but he wrote the Torah Mishnah, one of the fundamental books of Judaism, in Arabic. That's tell me if that uh, uh, is subjugated or not. And he was the private physician of Salahuddin, the one who defended the Crusaders. One of the brightest examples about that is at the time of the Crusaders that caused the death of six million Muslims, no reports whatsoever of local Christians being hurt in retaliation of the aggressions that happened. And I am the first one to admit that the Crusades got nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him. Uh, uh, again, I want to remind people, it is Palestine that is being occupied and hundreds of thousands and millions of Palestinians killed. It is Iraq that was invaded, causing hundreds of thousands of being killed. So is Afghanistan, so the Bosnia, so in Kashmir. So if you look at the numbers altogether and compare apples to apples, the 16,000 cases of terrorism that Mr. Spencer talks about, that's just half of the death that happened after the invasion of Iraq in one month in Iraq. So let's tell people the truth here. Okay. Uh, I